thank you so much for that kind introduction, and especially for the introduction of Chris. Thank you all for being here. It's such a joy. And I'm so excited to speak with Chris, whose book I have had the pleasure of reading. I'll just kind of jump right into it with you, Chris, um, because there's a lot to cover in your book. It traces the, the course of what is somewhat extraordinary life, it seems to me, um, or at least one thing you, the reader comes away with is that the incident in Central Park was a big moment in your life. But in, in many ways, if not for what came afterward, it might be just another colorful moment in an otherwise very colorful life that you talk about in the book. So to begin, I want to ask you a little bit about blackbirds, which are a central theme in the book and a lovely type of bird. Um, you say blackbirds can take a while to understand and appreciate for who and what they truly are. And you relate them to yourself in so some ways. So I wonder if you can talk about your journey in discovering who you truly are a little bit in those early years and how blackbirds and their winged compatriots offered a, a refuge for you. Sure. Um, uh, blackbirds, if you know anything about sort of the way birds are named, the common names, um, European settlers came over here and they would see a bird that you know looked vaguely like a bird they knew back home in Europe, and so they would s slap the same name on it, even though it may be a bird that was completely unrelated. So you end up with the situation with something like the red-winged blackbird, which, if you're from Europe, is not related at all to the blackbirds in Europe, but the blackbirds in Europe are actually related very closely to our American robins, which are not at all related to the robins in Europe, which are, are, are totally and completely different, but they do have a bird called the red wing, but that's actually related to our robin and not at all related to our red-winged blackbird. So you end up with a situation where you even experienced birders are kind of scratching their head like, okay. So, but that is sort of the situation I think so many of us, you know, face when we're young. And certainly I faced it as uh, someone growing up black in a white dominated culture, someone growing up queer in a straight dominated culture. And, and there are all these labels out there. You're a kid, you don't really know what's going on, but you have some inkling and you're trying to sort it all out. So that's why I think the, the black boy, blackbird is a particularly potent metaphor um, for that experience for myself. And then uh, uh, the other aspect is one of the American, the birds in the American blackbird family um, is the common grackle. And I took some kids out on a bird walk um, and I was having the hardest time finding birds to find for them. Um, but one of them said, oh, what's that over there? And I'm like, oh, it's a grackle. And if you're a birder, you know, you know, grackles are around. They're common, uh, they're dark birds, you know, no big deal. And this kid looked at the grackle and he said, it's beautiful. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? He's right. And I, I was able to drink in the grackle for the, as if for the first time, for the first time in a long time, and appreciate it's got iridescence on that, that dark body that gives it kind of a rainbow sheen across its body. It's got this fierce yellow eye. It's got this long tail that kind of creases into a V along its length. And I'm like, you know what? The kid is absolutely right. And that, that was, is another way, reason why I think blackbirds are, are kind of a metaphor for me, because... I had no sense of self-worth when I was a kid, um, particularly particularly in terms of you know my own sexual self self-worth or whatever. You know, I, I had no game, uh, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, I, I I went someplace a completely different context and and saw myself through somebody else's eyes, and suddenly I was like, <gasps> he's beautiful, and I'm like, really? <laughs> Who? Yeah, so uh, that that was. Uh, I think that's why blackbirds resonate a lot for me, and and uh, also sure. the biggest reason the red-winged blackbird is what we call my spark bird. Um, spark bird in birder lingo is the bird that gets you started birding, and so it was the the sight of a red-winged blackbird that got me all excited and launched me on this whole birding journey. So your your discussion of your personal journey for or learn or gaining the acceptance of people around you is quite moving. I will say, spoiler alert, does seem that by the end of your book, you did get some game, <laughs> if anybody's wondering. <laughs> and going, going from your spark bird for a moment, so it seems to me like 
many people have spark birds, as you talk about in the book. Many people also have spark birders in their lives. Mm. And you discuss a few of your formative influences, people who are just as nerdy, if not more so, who shape your love of birds. And I thought your discussion of Elliot Kuttner was really um, illuminating of the impact that other people can have on our own personal trajectories and also on our natural world discoveries and explorations. I wonder if you can talk about him a little bit and how he got you more into this world. Sure. Elliot was a force of nature, kind of like my grandmother. My grandmother was, was also a force of nature, but Elliot was just exuberance personified. And he took, you know, the, he was the one of the founders and uh, led the walks for South Shore Audubon, the South Shore Audubon Society. I grew up on the South Shore of Long Island, so when I was a kid and started birding at nine or ten years old, and my dad's like, all right, well, we got to foster this kid somehow. He talk, me, took me to a South Shore Audubon walk. And Elliot took one look and, you know, South Shore Audubon, especially back then, all white. Nobody black went to a South Shore Audubon Society walk. And here's this little black kid. And Elliot took one look at me and my fascination and love of birds. And he was like, this one's mine. <laughs> and just, you know, literally and figuratively took me under his wing. And I think that's, uh, uh, that's one reason why I don't talk, talk a lot about it in the book, because I don't like to put kids in the spotlight. That's not their role. You know, you want to shelter them and keep them out of, of the spotlight. But, um, so I don't talk about it in the book, but one thing I've been doing for like 35 years or more is working with kids in the New York Pu City public schools to teach them about birds. You know, I volunteer in the schools, get them outside on bird walks, and that's my paying it forward from what Elliot did for me. And I think that's incumbent on all of us, you know, whether it is um, birding or whatever your passion is, you know, we, hopefully we all had mentors. And it is our job to pass that on, to, to bring the next generation along and try to inspire some of our passion in them. And that's, that's really what Elliot did really, really profoundly. Yeah, it struck me that you are an Elliot for so many people now. Oh, I, uh, well, I hope so. Because, you know, the, with, with the show, you know, especially for everybody, but especially for black and brown kids, because there has been such a deficit of African American, uh, African Americans in birding. Um, so, and it's very difficult for you to imagine yourself doing something if you can't see anybody who looks like you already doing it. So, if a bunch of black and brown kids can tune into Extraordinary Birder and see that this show is being led by someone who looks like them, yeah. and it gets them thinking, oh, maybe I can do this? That would be awesome. And if the show accomplishes nothing else, I'm, I'm good with that. I recommend the show for anybody who hasn't watched it yet, National Geographic. Streaming on Disney+. Plus. <laughs> so speaking of that, you've worn many hats professionally. You're now an accomplished memoirist, in my mind, as well as the host of a TV show. You were a copy editor for a long time. You worked in magazines, pharmaceutical copy editing. You also had as you recount in the book, one successful night as a stripper for, uh, uh, for a bit. We, we don't have to dwell on that. <laughs> uh, but you, uh, the most important part of your life professionally, it seems, is the, was in the comics world. And I know that was mentioned a bit in the introduction up top, but can you talk a bit about how comics offered you another refuge and how they also, you know, this gets to another part of who you are, it seems, but you uh, were not afraid to push the envelope a little bit within the comics industry as well. So I wonder if you could talk about comics and, and how you, you know, accomplished, a, broke a few barriers there. As well. Sure. Um, uh, comic. It wasn't just that comics. Well, comics were an escapist refuge, but it, more specifically, Marvel Comics in the '90s was a basket of weirdos, and we loved it for that reason. We all found refuge there because we're all, you know, this is long before Marvel conquered pop culture and became a worldwide phenomenon with the movies. This is just, you know, a bunch of people who were too old to be reading comic books, still reading comic books and loving it and wanting to make them up for very little money. Um, and, and so we all ended up at Marvel and we all had our quirks and our weirdnesses and we were all thrown together and there was room for all of us. And it was really, uh, I, I, I hope I cap captured some of the joy of being there and the fun of being there in, in, the, in the chapter about Marvel, because it really was a, a wonderful place to be. Um, 
what was not happening a lot when I was there was any sort of gay or lesbian stuff. In fact, there was none. Um, because there is this crazy notion in the world, and it is sadly gaining new purchase today or coming back today, that number one, anything gay is not for kids. I will tell you, as someone who has known he was gay from the age of about five years old, that's nonsense, because there are gay kids, like I was. Um, and then there's the statement that, oh yeah, and comics are only for children, which is also nonsense, because if you go to Japan or Europe, there are adults reading comics all over the place. If you go to the corner comic book store or any place in America, you'll find a bunch of arrested development grown up usually men, at the racks, <laughs> reading comic books, people like me. Um, so, you know, that, but that, those twin ideas that um, comics are only for kids and, noth and, and nothing gay is for children sort of created this, this block to anything happening with, with gay stuff in the comics. Well, someone forgot to tell us, because we weirdos, particularly my boss, Bobby Chase, and the guy who was writing a particular comic book at that time, um, they decided, oh, yeah, uh, th it's been hinted at for years that this character is gay. We might as well just bring it out into the open at this point. And, you know, it was probably, I was her assistant editor at the time. It was probably our naivete that we thought, yeah, no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Read the chapter, you'll find out what happened. <laughs> but it, it kind of it became a thing. Um, but I, I, you know, we kicked down the door, and that was that. Yeah. So. My another thing you have to read about that I will say you you get a, a sense of it is there was a Marvel swimsuit issue. <laughs> oh no no not an issue it came out every year for several years but then they put me in. <laughs> Whose idea was this? To put the gay man in charge of Marvel swimsuit. I'm like, seriously? I, 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 you know, and my boss is a woman. And we, we're the ones who are going to do Marvel swimsuit. And I was quite honest with, with my boss, Bobby, a uh, woman, B-O-B-B-I-E. Um, and um, I, I said, look, Bobby, if I'm going to do swimsuit, I'm going to be an equal opportunity objectifier. It's going to be men and women, you know, no more... A black <laughs> widow in a string thong bikini arching her back while Captain America is in the background fuzzy in board shorts. No. Everyone's going to be, you know, flaunting it. And uh, for one thing, it would inoculate us against charges of sexism. And for another thing, it's what I wanted to see. So, you know. <laughs> and that's what I did. <laughs> and people didn't know it hit them. So. If, if, I'm, if I may just read one quote from the comic book writer Warren Ellis that you include in, in your book. He describes that year's issue, uh, that year's swimsuit issue, as the gayest thing you ever saw. <laughs> like gaydar installations all over the northern hemisphere just straight up burst into flames. <laughs> Anyone who beheld that book from a distance of 20 feet became, by genetic testing, 3% gayer. <laughs> Well, what can I tell you? <laughs> it, I think that 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 moment in your career speaks to a an activist side of you that has long been a part of your life, long been a part of your family's history as well. Mm -hmm. And so, before we get to Central Park, I think to help contextualize that, I wonder if you could talk. You know, I'd be interested. You talk a lot about your dad in the book, your up and down relationship with him. That, as I was telling Chris before, is really um, it's so thoughtful, and it. it I'm not. I don't want to be too, uh, it brought a tear to my eye, I'll just say that. And I am quick to cry generally, but not when reading. Um, so thank you for that, Chris. Uh, or no, thank you. But I wonder if you could talk a bit about the, the history or the legacy of good trouble in your family that seems you inherited a bit from your father. Yeah, I, I talked a little bit about this yesterday uh, in the panel, which is that um, you know, both my parents, my mom and my dad, were active in the civil rights movement back in the day. You know, not in any sort of um, marquee way, but they were foot soldiers. They, they did their part. They were out marching and protesting. And they never, to me or my sister, ever said, you know, um, this is what you have to do. It was just known in our family that if you see something that is wrong in the world, it is your personal responsibility to do something to try to fix it. Um, and, and that was just a given. And I, I will detour a little bit, uh, I think as I also did yesterday, to say to everybody here, um, never, 
underestimate your own personal power to affect change. There are people in this society who are, de who are determined to make you think that you don't have that power, that you can't make a difference because they are invested in not having things change. Don't let them convince you of it. We have the power to change, to make a, a, an impact on climate change. We have uh, the power to make an impact on saving our democracy. And it, if, if these things don't happen, don't look for anyone else to blame but ourselves. So. Everybody, please get busy. <laughs> Sorry, and I will once again step off the soapbox. <laughs> but yes, there was there was very much this activist uh, 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 streak in our family, and you know, uh, one of the my favorite parts of the book, uh, because it was one of my favorite things that happened. My dad and I got arrested side by side at a protest, uh, essentially a Black Lives Matter protest before there was a Black Lives Matter. Um, uh, uh, movement officially, and it, it was it was at uh, it, it was a a similar situation where police had killed an unarmed innocent black man, and um, so my dad and I were 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 on the protest lines, and we got arrested, and we ended up in the jail cell. They had the women went to one jail cell, the men went to a separate jail um, to await processing. And so I'm there, and, you know, I'm, I'm well, back then, I was relatively young. Um, but my dad and all these older men, because it was mostly older men who had come out to protest, were all in the jail together. And they were all civil rights ve veterans. And one of them started to sing a spiritual. And they all took it up. And I didn't know the words. But the station house was filled with the sound of these black men's voices ringing through that building. And I saw my dad transform before my eyes because suddenly he was back in the day. And I could see him when he, what he must have been like in his 20s. And as soon as that song was finished, oh no, Francis Cooper sang in a chorus and he was taking up the next <laughs> song and he started them up on the next one. And the station house was just filled with their voices and it was such a powerful sound and such a powerful experience and uh, 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 rivaled only by one other thing that, that, I, uh, that I experienced that I, I talk about in the book. And it, it was pretty amazing. So yes, there is that, that history of activism. And it was wonderful to have in that point and another point I talk at the at, in the book where my dad's experience and mine kind of collided and we were able to bond on, on that level. So, Scintillating part of the book, you're talking about this singing that's going on around you. Um, appreciate that. And I think we have to, before we open things up to the audience, I think we, we should talk about Central Park a little bit. And I think it's, it's connected to what you're just discussing because the event both occurred on the same, um, same day that George Floyd was murdered, earlier that same day in May 2020. And in your book, you frame your discussion of it around the murder of Philando Castile. So I wonder if you could, which you describe as a, a turning point for you in some ways. So I wonder if you could talk about why you frame it within Castile's tragic death and then maybe give us, for the uninitiated, you know, some of the broad swaths of the unfortunate Amy Cooperanian events uh, that occurred in, in the park that day. All right, so first of all, show of hands, uh, who knows the, about the details of the Philando Castile case? All right, so, so just quick summary to bring you up to speed. Philando Castile, uh, African-American man, oddly enough, in Minneapolis, where George Floyd years later would be killed, um, driving with his girlfriend and his girlfriend's uh, ch uh, young daughter in the, in the back seat of the car. Oh, she, the daughter, I think, was something like six or seven years old, maybe nine or ten. What, but anyway, they're driving from a county fair. They get pulled over for a routine traffic uh, stop infraction kind of thing. Um, and by the end of that encounter, Philando Castile, and Philando Castile did all the things that you know black mothers tell their sons to do in order to survive an encounter with the police. So you know he was respectful to the police officer. He kept his hands on the steering wheel. He volunteered to the police officer, "Sir, I have a handgun in the car. I am licensed and legal. It's legally registered." And before that encounter was over. Philando Castile was shot dead and bleeding out in front of his girlfriend in the front in the front seat and that little girl watching in the back of the car. And when that happened, I think a lot of us, we get you know, a lot of us African Americans, you can't help it. You go go through and you you replay the events and you're like, okay, well, what would I have done to 
have a different outcome to avoid that. And there was nothing. There was absolutely nothing. And at that point, I kind of decided, you know what? They're going to shoot us dead no matter what we do. And if that's the case, I'm going out with my dignity intact. I am not going to contort myself into a pretzel so that some white person, police or otherwise, feels more comfortable, feels like I'm safe and non-threatening or whatever. I'm going to do whatever any white person would do in that same situation, and that's that. Um, and that informed my reaction. That informed my reaction to what happened in Central Park. Um, you know, I, uh, the phrase I often go to, uh, when I sort of had that moment of decision, when she tried to weaponize things and said, you know, well, I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. And uh, there was that moment. You can't help it. You know, you grow up in this society as a black person, and you're like, oh, this is a world of hurt coming towards me. You know, what can I do to avoid this? And my mind started racing. I'm like, okay, well, maybe if I c uh, acquiesce to her wishes, because she, what pissed her off was that I was recording on my on my camera, on my iPhone. And like, maybe if I stop recording, this will all go away. And I thought, it, uh, it was a split second later, and I thought of Philando Castile, and I'm like, you know what? No, I am not going to comply. I am not going to be complicit in my own dehumanization, which was really what was going to happen in that situation. And I'm like, I'm going to keep recording no matter what, as any other person would, whether they were black, brown, green, blue, or whatever. And I'm just going to keep doing it. And then, you know, everything else happened that happened. So, yeah, yeah and I, I, I love that your book, kind of like our conversation, though your book is preferable. I, I love that your book really leads up to that moment. And that there's so much that goes on in your life before. There's so much that's occurred afterward. And I know, I think we're, we're running up on time. We're, we're getting close to asking for audience participation. Am I a few more minutes? Okay, fabulous. Make it ten. <laughs> I I wonder. You've since been to Selma, Alabama, uh, in the recording of your show, and I know you've said that that's where your favorite episode was. And you reflect. Um, you say that you are now. I know you say a footnote, of course, but you are now part of the annals of this nation's racial strife, as a you footnote. put it. A but even still, it's something that's really. Um, you know, both m m it's tragic and it's um it's it's i guess it's moving again is that you you mentioned how during the, the so it's not tragic uh, uh, uh george floyd was tragic <laughs> no 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 what I'm happened to me was was you know uh, compared to that it's not tragic in fact it, it was revelatory for a lot of people and that's why it matters I was I wasn't going to say that it was tragic for you. No offense. Uh, I, I was <laughs> not I, I was only be, only based on what you, what you wrote. I was going to say that the, it's the deaths of so many people that 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 sparked the BLM movement. All those the people who whose names were chanted. Everybody's name. Everybody whose names were chanted are dead now. But your name was also chanted, and you are sitting here today. And as you say in the book, things could have turned out differently. I wonder how do you how do you ref, how do you reflect on this kind of crazy transformation in your life, being part of of, of a national movement, uh, doing something that you loved, uh, you know, on a, on a daily basis. It's funny because um, a very nice woman came up to me just a little while ago, <laughs> and she said the nicest thing to me. And I was like, I don't deserve this. I, I have not earned this. You have, because you, you helped integrate Duke, Duke University. You did the work. But the way I look at it is that if people are going to put this on me, I'm going to live up to it. I am going to do my best to, to, to communicate what George Floyd can't, because he's in the grave, what Breonna Taylor can't, because she's in the grave. Um, and I'm going to do my best to, to try to be the voice that they no longer have. Um, I don't know if I'm up to it, but it's not something I can shirk because it is a responsibility that all of us have. The, I am standing on the shoulders of my parents. I am standing on the shoulders of so many people, including that, that woman who came up to me today just an hour ago. And we've got to move the ball forward, all of us, for the next generation so that we leave them something better. 
that's our job. Um, so I will do, yes, it has been crazy. It, it was not expected. And when it first happened, I wanted to crawl under a rock until my life went back to normal. That is not an option. And I quickly came to realize that it is my job to be that voice if I can and to move things forward. And that's all of our job. So. But I, th I think, you know, in my not so significant opinion, I think you do a really wonderful job of being honest and forthright and vulnerable in the book. Uh, and and moving things forward, so I appreciate that. I guess if we since we have since we have the time, I I asked Chris if he wouldn't mind reading one of my favorite passages from the book, uh, which is in the conclusion. I have it here. It maybe just to, it starts here, Chris. Uh, these are your words, um, but maybe just as a setup. So this uh, this occurs. Oh, I can do this from memory. No, I can't. <laughs> no. <laughs> this occurs in Selma. This occurs on your your trip to Selma. And maybe just to set the stage before you read this, read this passage, you can talk about Swifts a little bit. Sure, sw Swifts, and I haven't, I haven't seen any since I've been here, um, but Swifts are frequently seen in our summer skies. Um, they are um, uh, uh, aerialists. They live their lives on the wing, except when they roost at night or they're nesting. Um, so you will hear, they look like flying cigars, um, uh, and they're, they're all dark birds, and you will hear them usually first, because they are often very vocal, and you'll hear this high pitch twittering from above, and your head will shoot up, and you'll see this fly, flying cigar fluttering on almost bat-like wings, because its wings are it has a stiff-winged flight. So you'll see that, see them zooming around, eating up the bugs to make our life better. Um, so, um, but the thing about swifts, uh, and in the east we have chimney swifts, is that um, they are declining for a lot of reasons, but one of them is that um, there are fewer chimneys. Um, they used to nest, uh, you know, before people, they nested in holes in trees. They adapted to chimneys and their numbers went up, but now chimneys are capped. People don't, you know, use wood chimneys that much anymore, so their numbers are going down. So when I was in Alabama, one of their projects was to find out you know, where Swifts are, are nesting now and to try to preserve them. So we heard chimney Swifts, and we were all like, chimney Swifts, and we, went, we were all a little tipsy, too, because we'd been drinking, celebrating the end of a, a bird festival um, uh, down in Alabama. And so we rushed out to see the, the Swifts. And what we saw shocked us. The Swifts, birds that more than any other in North America live in the sky, touch the ground. We're dumbfounded. Collectively, we who are, who are gathered on this Selma Street corner have known these birds for decades, if not centuries, yet we've never even heard of such a thing. The swifts alight in the middle of the asphalt for just a moment, fluttering wing, be wing beats caught in the, in the beams of the street lamps and then return to the sky. There's no discernible reason why, no water pooled on the street that they might be drinking, no insects to feed on that we can see. And besides, snatching bugs from the ground, as opposed to midair, contradicts everything we know about swift behavior. We're at a loss to explain it. It's a moment when, as a birder, I'm reminded we know so very little. I'm not just OK with that. I'm thrilled by it. I'm thrilled that I can hear the sound of ravens, the bird geniuses, and have absolutely no idea what they're communicating. I'm delighted that I'm hopeless for now at puzzling out which little peep sandpiper is which, and that when something utterly unexpe unexpected happens, like a hovering Costa's hummingbird running her bill up and down my calf because she's checking out my leg hair as potential nest material, <laughs> that really happened. It's more than just my skin that tingles with excitement. It means my whole life through, I'll still be learning something new from birding, right until they pry the binoculars from my cold, dead hands. <laughs> What a terrible, wonderful curse we suffer from to find joy in chasing flying cigars through town to witness the impossible by the light of ordinary street lamps. What ridiculous fools we must be. What birders. And there are 280 more pages. <laughs> of that beautiful writing and birding tips. <laughs> and I think from there, we can open up for, for more questions. Hi, Christian. Uh, thanks so much for coming to the island and sharing everything from the bird walk yesterday to here. I've been thinking 
ever since yesterday when you shared the story on the panel about your encounter in the Australian outback mm -hmm. and how things went so much better there than they might have if the same thing had unfolded here. And maybe you've already told us the answer implicitly, but I just wanted to ask you directly, after such a positive experience like that in Australia, why don't you think, maybe I'll just stay here. After that, what makes you want to come back here where things are still so so fraught and we have so much work to do? Well, because there is so much work to do and because this is home. Um, you know, I, I could go off to Australia and, and, you know, immerse myself in that culture and be fun for a while, I'm sure. Um, but it's not where my family is. It's not where, where my roots are. It's not, you know, it doesn't have the birds I've grown up with to, and know to love. Um, I, I'd find new birds, I'm sure. But it's also, I think it's a mistake to go, go to other places and expecting that that is somehow going to be the solution to things because, um, you know, Australia has actually some pretty deep, deep racism, yeah, deep racism of its own. It's just not directed at African Americans. Instead, it's directed at, at Aborigines or at Asians. So you know that's not a solution for. I, I, it might be a, a solution for me. Um, if I was going to take that solution, I'd probably stay in Buenos Aires, not in Australia. <laughs> um, read the book, you'll find out why. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it, it's that that doesn't really address. The issue, I, I don't feel. Thank you. So I just wanted to ask you, part of this story, um, story in Central Park was in, in the aftermath, your forgiveness. It was kind of extraordinary the way I, I saw it. So I just wanted you to talk to, about that in particular. Sure. Uh, there, was, there was a lot going on there, a lot of pieces to it. And that was, in many ways, the most painful part was when I, I you know, decided I wasn't going to uh, cooperate with the prosecution. And I got a lot of blow black, uh, blowback from uh, uh, a lot of people in the black community for that, understandably. I, I was on the fence about it myself. Um, so why did I go that route? For, well, for one thing, um, I was there. So it's really easy to view someone as sort of a cardboard villain when you're just reading about what happened. But when you're there, you know, as flawed as that person may be, you know, I couldn't help but see her as another human being, human being who did a really crappy racist thing um, and who was obviously not in control of herself when it happened. That's not an excuse, but that, you know, she was not, she, she did a lot of things that were off um, uh, in that situation. Um, so, you know, I can't help but see her as a, as a person, whereas I think everybody else, you know, you read the account and, and it's easier to, to villainize her. But I think there's something more important going on, which is that what was important about what happened in that moment, it's not about her. It's about what it revealed about the underlying racial bias in this society that runs deep. I mean, if it is showing up in liberal New York City, in Central Park, with someone who was Canadian, for God's sake, um, and who uh, considers herself an Obama voter and never used any kind of slur, you know, she was very, used all the right terms, African American. If it bubbles up there, and we black people know this, we run into it all the time, but it was revelatory, I think, for a lot of white people that, oh, wow, really? And it's like, yeah, really. Um, that's what's important, is recognizing how deeply that bias goes. Now, we can focus on her and go after her and prosecute her and, you know, high-five each other that we threw her in jail. Meanwhile, the Supre Supreme Court of the United States is rolling back affirmative action. Now, which of these manifestations of inherent bias do you think is more meaningful, going to impact more people, and is the thing we really need to focus on and fight back against? Don't let them distract you. Keep your eyes on the prize and what's important and fight for that. Um, hi. Um, I was a Central Park birder, rambler, rambler birder in the 80s. Um, when did you get started doing, getting into Central Park? I remember I lived in New York probably a year before I figured out that there were birds in Central Park. <laughs> it, was, it was about the same for me. Uh, um, uh, it took me a little while to figure out, oh, this is the burning hotspot, really? Um, and it is. 
Um, uh, I started birding the ramble, I would say, about probably 86. Yeah, some, yeah that, was con that was just as I left, and the ramble didn't have a great reputation at that time. No, you, what's really fascinating is that, you know, once I became sort of a regular presence in Central Park, there were lots of little old white ladies who would ask me to bird with them so that they would feel safer as they went through Central Park. <laughs> <laughs> Tell that to Amy Cooper, you know. So. <laughs> uh. the, the most interesting thing I found was a, about a eight or seven or eight year old white boy who was running down the path with his bicycle, and he, I said, "Well, where are your parents?" He said. I don't know, but I really have to go to the bathroom. And, <laughs> and so I, I, his parents never came, up, came along, so I took him down to the boathouse, which is on the lake there, and sort of turned him over to a cop. I mean, he knew where he lived, but the cop looked at me like, <laughs> now, what, did you, what have you been doing with this little boy? So it can cut all different ways. <laughs> Well, I, I will extol the, the, the wonders and the value of birding Central Park um, if, if for no other reason besides the fact that it concentrates really fabulous birds during migration. It's got essentially paved paths everywhere that anybody can walk. Um, it's got benches, so if you get tired, you can sit down and rest. It's got ample uh, bathrooms in various places and places to get food. So it's like birding made easy. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's worth doing. That's good. All right. Well, th thank you so much, Chris. Oh, my pleasure. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you both. And Chris will be signing his book. <laughs>